Next, forbidden parallels. Here's another principle of chorale part writing that's a bit more difficult to discern, but it's equally important to this style, and it involves the special avoidance of certain parallel perfect intervals. And here's the rule. If the interval of a harmonic perfect fifth appears between any two voices, it will never appear between those same two voices on the next chord. In other words, we will rarely, if ever, see parallel fifths motion in any pairs of voices. And similarly, if the interval of a harmonic unison or octave appears between any two voices, it will not appear between those same two voices on the next chord. An easier way to say that is, we will rarely, if ever, see parallel octaves or parallel unison motion in any pairs of voices. So the parallel fifths, the parallel octaves, and the parallel unisons are called forbidden parallels. So here's some examples. Now, to make it easier here, we haven't included all four voices. We're just including a couple of voices. We're including the soprano and, let's say, the alto. No, actually, this is the soprano and the tenor. And it's a mistake in each case. So the first one, C and G, moving to D and A. The first interval is a perfect fifth. The next interval is a perfect fifth. That would be considered a mistake. You might ask yourself, well, why? Why is this considered a mistake? It really has to do with the sound, the nature of the sound of the fifth, which is a very hollow sound, which is closely aligned, really, with the overtone series. And I think the composers just felt that if you were going to write an interval of a fifth followed by another interval of a fifth in parallel motion, it really doesn't sound like they're separate voices. They sound too connected, like almost like they're just one is an overtone of the other. And the same thing with octaves. It's just too plain of a sound. Look at the next example, B, where we've got a, a C in the tenor and a C in the soprano, and they both move up to octaves again, D and D. Again, the problem is those really sound like the same voice, the same melody, just doubled. It's not really going to contribute much to a four-part writing style. C. These are parallel unisons. In this case, both the soprano and the tenor have the exact same note. That's definitely not something that you would want to do. That's called parallel unisons. The last example is a little trickier. We have a C in the tenor and a G in the soprano, moving to a G in the tenor and a D in the soprano. But notice that in both cases, they are the interval of the fifth. It's a fifth and actually moves to a twelfth, but essentially that's the interval of a fifth as well. This was what we call the consecutive perfect fifths by contrary motion. It's really the same problem as um, parallel fifths, so you want to avoid that as well. Now here's some examples. This is example 5.8. This is actually allowable, and don't worry about these things because these are perfectly fine in the music. Here's A, B, and a G. Well, that's a sixth. Moving to an A and an F, which is another sixth. Those really sound quite nice, those intervals. That's allowable. The only forbidden intervals are fifths, unisons, and octaves, if they're parallel. This, let's look at B, C, and F going to D and G. Now that's a rather hollow sounding interval as well, but it's not forbidden. You can have parallel fourths. The C example is a little trickier. Take a look. B to F. That looks like a fifth, doesn't it? B to F. And then A to E. You might say, oh, that's parallel fifths. But actually it's not because the first interval, B to F, that's a diminished fifth. It's not a perfect fifth. B to F sharp would be a perfect fifth. So fifths, if they're moving in the same direction, are okay as long as they're not 
both perfect. In this case, the diminished fifth to the perfect fifth is called unequal fifths, and that's okay. And this last example, D, is really what um, trips up students quite a bit. Take a look. It's C to G, which is definitely a perfect fifth, going to C and G again, another perfect fifth. And you might be tempted to say, oh, that's parallel fifths. I can't do that. But in fact, you can do that. The reason is it's it's not moving. It's If you have to, to call it parallel fifths, it means that vo both voices have to be moving in one direction, but they're not moving. They're just staying the same on the fifth from one chord to the next. So that's no motion there, and there's nothing wrong with that. Okay. Now, one of the problems is when you're writing in four parts, it can be very difficult to figure out if you've got forbidden parallel intervals. Let's take a look at this example, 5.9. Let me just play through it for you. It's in the key of E flat. And that's what it sounds like. To find forbidden parallels, you're going to have to isolate each pair of voices and look at them independently. Eventually, you'll get better at doing this, um, and you'll be able to pick up these parallels. But this is the way you should do it for now. Take a look. In other words, we're going to examine each possible pair of voices and see if we find any forbidden intervals. So the first thing we'll do, we'll take the alto and the soprano and go through and just see those two voices, sixth, fifth, sixth, fourth, sixth. No problem there. I don't see any two fifths in a row or two unisons in a row or two octaves in a row. Next, let's take a look at the soprano and the tenor. That's the B flat with the E flat. And then a third, and then a third, and then a sixth, and then a fourth. No problem there. By the way, if the intervals are compound intervals that is bigger than an octave, I reduce that to a simple interval just so that I can see the flow of the intervals better. For example, that first interval, really B flat to that high E flat, really is an eleventh, but I'll reduce it and call it a fourth. Okay, let's take a look at the soprano and the bass. So we have a E flat in the bass, E flat in the soprano. We're going to call that an octave. Octave, melody moves. That's a fifth. Moves to A flat and C. That's a third. Then we have a B flat in the bass and a B flat in the soprano. Oh, and now we've got an E flat in the bass and an E flat in the soprano. That's a problem because we have one octave there moving in parallel motion to another octave. That's a forbidden interval. It's called parallel octaves. So you can continue your search. For example, you can look uh, between the alto and the tenor. I don't think you'll see any problems there. Or you could look between the alto and the bass. Or you could look between the tenor and the bass. Actually, we should stop right there and take a look at that a little more closely. Um, look for intervals of the fifth between any of those notes, the alto and the bass. Do you see the fifth on the third chord between the A flat and the E flat? And then also the fifth between the B flat and the F on the fourth chord? So two perfect fifths in a row in parallel motion. See, the problem is not that there's a fifth. Fifths are fine. The problem is that there's one fifth followed by another fifth, and the pitches are moving in parallel motion into it. So that's parallel fifths. OK, you're ready for 5.2. Check your understanding. Here is a four-part example. You're looking for forbidden parallel intervals. You have to take each pair of voices and look independently to see if you see any of those problems. The last 
topic we'll talk about is called direct fifths and octaves. And this is a little bit more difficult to see, perhaps, and we're not going to need to be too concerned with this at the beginning of our part writing, but you may encounter this occasionally, so I'm going to point out this rule. A direct octave or a direct fifth is when we have a sort of exposed octave or an exposed fifth between the outer voices. And composers were actually rather cautious about doing that because they found that the fifths and the octaves were rather stark intervals. So we'll be careful about doing that. And when we um, examine these, what we're looking out for are three conditions that might happen. So we're talking about a fifth or an octave only between the bass and the soprano. It's on, this is the problem is only going to arise there. And the approach to the fifth or octave is by similar motion. That means the bass and the soprano are moving in the same direction. And the approach to the fifth or octave involves a skip in the soprano voice. And that would create the problem. So the idea is that you've got sort of this skip or this leap into this very stark interval. Let's take a look. This is the key of C. C and then we have a four chord, F, F, A, C. And we're moving to a five chord like that. The problem here is the first interval between the bass and the soprano is a fifth. And then the next interval between the bass and the soprano goes up into an octave. The voices are moving in similar motion and the soprano is leaping into the octave. That's called a direct octave. Again, you might hear that as a rather subtle issue, but I'm pointing it out here just for to make this discussion complete. Let's look at the second example. Here's a one chord, and we're going to move into the next chord. So we've got the interval between the C and the E, which is actually a third or a tenth, but the soprano is moving and skipping down to the C, and the bass is skipping as well, down to the F. Both voices are skipping in the same direction into perfect fifths. A rather stark introduction to the perfect fifth interval. So again, at this point, I would say don't be too concerned about direct fifths and octaves, but there may be times when we're going to point that out. 
The problem here is the first interval between the bass and the soprano is a fifth. And then the next interval between the bass and the soprano goes up into an octave. The voices are moving in similar motion and the soprano is leaping into the octave. That's called a direct octave. Again, you might hear that as a rather subtle issue, but I'm pointing it out here just for to make this discussion complete. Let's look at the second example. Here's a one chord, and we're gonna move into the next chord. So we've got the interval between the C and the E, which is actually a third or a tenth, but the soprano is moving and skipping down to the C, and the bass is skipping as well, down to the F. Both voices are skipping in the same direction into perfect fifths. A rather stark introduction to the perfect fifth interval. So again, at this point, I would say don't be too concerned about direct fifths and octaves, but there may be times when we're going to point that out. 